Welcome to Behavior Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. Today's podcast is part of our clinician series where we take you into the therapeutic experience itself, allowing you to hear and learn what occurs between the practitioner and the client. As a clinician, I love these podcasts because they allow you, our listeners, to appreciate the dynamics that take place in the therapeutic interactions, the words and the feelings that get exchanged, and the process of change that can be transformative. Our returning guest today for this clinician series podcast is Shai Tubali. Shai is an academic philosopher, speaker, and leading authority in the field of self-development and self-empowerment. Shai is also a best-selling author of numerous books, inspiring many thousands on their inner journeys of mental, emotional, and spiritual transformation. Shai's active vision is a spirituality that does not lead away from the world, but rather straight into the heart of life. A trained yogi with 25 years of studies in the field of Eastern thought and yogic traditions, Shai has become one of Europe's experts in the ancient chakra system. Shai has created a significant list of methods that mix meditation, therapy, and self-empowerment into highly effective integral processes. Shai, welcome back to our show. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Graham. I'm so happy to be here again. That's so nice. You know, Shai, in our first show together, uh, you shared with us an overview of your transformative perspective and the techniques of medica- meditation. And folks, as you're listening today, I so encourage you to go back to that, that first show. It's really a great show. And you, you, you talk, Shai, about the pathways of transcendent states of consciousness that you've developed mm. For this type of journey, it was a beautiful show to do with you. But I want to start today as as we begin here. At the heart of your work, Shai, what are you wanting most for those that work with you? Well, I I would say that at the heart of my work, my my intention is to to help people to move from a contracted state of consciousness in which they uh, they experience uh, a a sort of problem consciousness, uh, uh, internal contradiction, uh, a sense of limitation, and and so on, to yeah. a heightened or broader state of consciousness in which they can, well, basically experience a, 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 a state of being in which problems cannot even exist. Yeah. So that so it, it's that this level of 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 freedom from from any sense of problem, any sense of conflict in order to to feel empowered to resolve their problems, their conflicts, their contradiction. I recall how you took us the first time, uh, and we're going to talk more about this path that you weave together, both the psychological and the spiritual techniques. But this, you're, you're saying, as I mentioned in the introduction, this spirituality does not lead away from the world. In fact, you lead straight into the heart of it in, with the intention of developing meaning, a greater personal depth, a, a better order to, to clarify and, and, and manage complex and oftentimes challenging aspects of our lives, working through the ambiguous, working through the complex experiences, trying to integrate more kind of a holistic understanding, which allows kind of a transformation to be clarified, doesn't it? Yes, exactly, and 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 I would say that uh, uh, this this kind of uh, of message or insistence on on uh, employing uh, heightened states of consciousness uh, to achieve this kind of uh, of liberation in life itself, this came into being as a result of observing uh, people, especially in the in the spiritual mindfulness scene. Uh-huh. Uh, and realizing that that they use a uh, higher states of consciousness and meditation uh, to escape their challenges and actually develop a, a, some sort of hypersensitivity uh, this this feeling that they are incapable of of facing any of life's challenges because everything feels just too much yes. and then I, I i began to think about this and 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 realize that that somehow we are abusing these states of consciousness whereas what they're really meant to do is is that they're meant to be at the service of human life so mm-hmm. so ever since i've i've begun to enc- encourage people to to 
settle in these states of consciousness and from there to, to direct their attention to their yeah. present problems. So, yeah. so, so they could never really escape life in this way. <laughs> so to escape life was actually a disservice. It was robbing somebody of an opportunity to really lean into things in a much more meaningful way. In fact, uh, I'd, I'd love our listeners to get a better sense of this because the framework that you've, you're talking about uh, had in our first show, one of the core tenets being the law of attention, mm -hmm. not distraction, not avoidance, not denial, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. law of attention. And a lot of times people say, you want me to do what? You want me to lean into this? You want me to stay in this moment? And what you're saying, yes, it's something in that. And you're talking about that law of attention. It becomes kind of the key to the psychological and spiritual freedoms that you're saying are available to us if we can do it in this way. In fact, you talk about how it becomes kind of uh, uh, our inner freedom. You don't think there's anything else necessary that we really need to understand. And that attention is the greatest source of power that we actually possess. So explain for us, if you would, Shai, this law of attention and its various aspects. Yes, of course, uh, I would love to, to do that. Uh, well, the law of attention basically states something uh, so simple, so strikingly simple that, 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 that we, we, could, we could wonder, uh, we might wonder how come we haven't even noticed it. But, but it simply states that there is a certain, a certain uh, gap of, of a, a choice and identification between, ev between our attention, our awareness, and everything we give attention to. This includes any sort of, of thoughts uh, uh, and feelings and emotions and memories. Now, thanks to this gap, we, the, the thing, because we are not aware of this gap, we become, our attention becomes glued, uh, uh, completely connected or inseparably connected to, to these thoughts, memories, emotions, and so on. Uh, to a degree that we feel that we're 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 hunted by these memories and thoughts and emotions, they become monster-like yeah. in a way that that we feel that we that they have their own power. Now, the law of attention is all about giving us the power, <laughs> regaining this sense of of power, uh, understanding that 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 things become uh, meaningful and powerful in only if we ascribe meaning and power to them. Now, it's very important to understand that the law of attention here applies to, uh, to, um, to spirituality and meditation. And to a certain degree, it's different uh, from, from the way we would approach it in psychology and therapy. Why is that? This is because, because I would say that this is also the major difference between uh, spirituality and psychology or meditation and psychology, because in spirituality, you are basically uh, stopping to ascribe meaning and power to any of your thoughts, feelings, memories. You see, you are, you are entering a state in which you are recovering your, your power of attention to a degree that, that you are really... Uh, um, imbuing your being with presence and, uh, and, uh, and silence. So you're transcending all thoughts and emotions. This is, this is how we use the law of attention there. But there in psychology, go. in therapeutic processes, we would use the very same law of attention in order to, to, to learn to select the right, the constructive thoughts and feelings and memories and, and and to stop ascribing attention or a, a meaning and power to, to destructive, harmful thoughts and emotions. You've talked about how with that attention and kind of mining that gap, noticing how we give power to our thoughts. And you said we, we, we without understanding and maybe being conscious of it, we become what we focus on. Right. And what you're talking about here is paying attention to the law of attention that can take place in that gap where we actually have the ability, if we realize it, to relax this attention 
And the freedom not to choose something at all, but just to sit in that moment with it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's meditation. If I yeah. meditation is the is the relaxation of my attention is is realizing that we don't have to be uh, well obsessively focused on and identified with certain uh, thoughts emotions or, or any other objects of our consciousness we can actually uh, remain in this state of pure attentiveness this is what we can call also uh, expansive mindfulness Mm -hmm. uh, but but it is also the, the very same law applies to to our ability to uh, to stop becoming certain uh, uh, certain patterns of behavior to stop becoming one with uh, certain uh, destructive approaches to life so yes. then we you 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 feel the tremendous freedom of being able to simply not even saying no. You, uh, you see, based on the law of attention, you don't need to resist or struggle with certain, with your, the content of your mind. You can simply seize, give it attention. And that is all. That is the power. Yeah, yes. and in that power, that's where you're saying, if we can expand that mindfulness and sustain that attention necessary, we can begin to alter what we've always been affronted by, conflicted with, and we the 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 destruction of those things in our lives that can hold us down or tie us down or weight us down. And there's a freedom in that. I want to talk about that mindful mm. expansion in just a moment and weave yes. it in here because you use it, you okay. use a number of methods to illuminate the different dimensions of human life to guide and achieve this personal transformation that you say you're saying is possible. You use power psychology, you use expansion model, you use a right. chakra psychology, uh, chakra personality types, the seven yeah. hearts. And you're, you're one of Europe's experts in the ancient chakra system. And mm -hmm. if you could take me and our listeners into the primary meditation that you use to illuminate the different dimensions of one's life, this, expand the, the this expansive mindfulness that helps folks in this transcendent state of yes. consciousness to become more aware more balanced give us if you could shy kind of an experiential understanding of what folks are mm. going through and doing with you in this process yes 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 that that's that's a, a good question thank you well i would say that that uh, that um, my major uh, uh, method is the expansion method and uh, in because because actually it is a, it is a certain it is a certain principle uh, that systemizes uh, the the process of of meditation or the essential process of meditation this means that that, that in, within uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, people are able to uh, to attain higher states of consciousness now when uh, um, in, in, in traditional terms, the expansion of consciousness uh, takes place by, by um, uh, expanding uh, our subtle fields of consciousness. Usually our mind uh, is, is completely contracted. It is, it is entirely focused on um, our physical mind, which is the brain and its, its thought patterns. Yes. So, so there is a certain, a certain contracted or, or a small island of, of, uh, of thoughts and emotions, and this is where we stand. Yeah. Now, what, what happens is, is that we're beginning to, to expand our consciousness, and we are beginning to experience a, a broader inner space. Now, we're moving through uh, these fields of consciousness, and eventually we reach, and pretty easily, what I regard as the, the third uh, field of consciousness, which is the mental spiritual state, the mental spiritual field. Now, this is where people begin to, uh, to smile. Uh, and, and regardless of whether they, they started the process uh, completely traumatized or focusing on very uh, um, deep-seated, uh, difficult emotions, um, 
they begin to smile because they begin to experience a, a certain broadness that one liberates them from any sense of past. They feel that, that their mind, they, they, they have tapped into a certain part of their consciousness which has, has remained unchanged and unaffected by, by past experiences. They feel that there is no problem whatsoever. They experience a, a absolute uh, positivity mm-hmm. and, and a, cer- a, certain, uh, a certain knowingness within mm-hmm. them, some kind of a heart knowing. And in general, in terms of their, their uh, identity, they experience themselves as what we can regard as a spirit experiencing human life rather than a human ex- trying mm-hmm. or hoping to experience spirit you see so yes. so th- this kind of fearlessness this kind of of expansiveness of of their being e- enables them to to begin to breathe deeply to feel a, a, this kind of 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 complete relief and complete release from uh, from their uh, hunting memories or or problems Sometimes many problems that they have, that they were struggling to resolve yeah. seem to, to be non-existent. Shai, this expansion model you're talking here is, is uh, it's really cool. You're talking about systemizing. Right. S- systematizing this essential process of meditation that within 10, 15 minutes, something begins to shift. Yeah. And then some things begin to move and then a smile comes and you're taking it from from a place of contraction where we're trapped and stuck and at the mercy of these things that we, we think define us and move it to an contraction to an expansion position where there's an openness to see and be and be free in those moments Mm -hmm. and empowered in those moments just to somehow have a detached realization that there's something spiritual going on. And what I like that you're saying, and I've, I'm just hearing the same term this week, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, not a humans mm-hmm. having a spiritual experience. Weave that part in here for me and how that gets more recognized as you go through this expansion process. How it gets uh, the, this be, kind to, of realization. To, exactly. More realization that, wait a minute, I'm not a human I think it's spiritual. I'm a spiritual having a human experience. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, this uh, first of all, we need to understand that this is uh, this kind of uh, of field of consciousness is always here in us. We just need to to become aware of it uh, because we are so uh, uh, intensely focused on 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 particular thoughts and emotions uh, moving in, in narrow circles. Now, what happens to us when we are uh, beginning to to expand our mind uh, is that we are beginning to experience uh, uh, liberation, liberation from the world. You see, the the thing is that usually our experience is that we are completely defined by the the world and and our circumstances. We actually feel non-existent if uh, we would actually feel non-existent if, if we removed the world, our relationships, and our uh, uh, social identities. Now, what yes. happens is that you are. It's. Uh, um, I, I. I don't know. I hesitate to to uh, to use this kind of example, but uh, but uh, just referring briefly to the to the gospels, Jesus uh, spoke uh, about about the need to be born twice. Yes. You see, <laughs> once yes. in, in the flesh and the second time in spirit. Now, yes. we all need to go through without uh, becoming Christians. <laughs> we all need to, to somehow uh, uh, be born again in spirit because we don't exist spiritually until we begin to, to expand our consciousness. So now what happens is that we're finally beginning to, to, to experience that we have our own presence, regardless of the world. Even if the whole world came apart, we would still be there. We don't need to feel, uh, we don't need to become some, uh, someone in the world that re- recovers our sense of self-confidence. 
we feel that 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 we are we are whole we are complete within ourselves so this liberates us from the need for uh, for the, the difficulty uh, uh, to love ourselves and to accept ourselves because now we are complete we experience ourselves as source rather than than dependent creatures it's it's as if you experience your your being as a sun yeah. radiating rather than consuming energies yes. and and recognition and gratification so you you practically feel that that you don't need to receive anything from anyone you're free from the world of opposites from ups and downs and you're no longer a wait for happiness in the future so all these kind of it's it's a tremendous collapse of of all the dependency that usually defines human life and the human psyche that's what that's the greatest gift that meditation can give us well that's a wonderful description of the process i appreciate that you know i'm thinking that as we kind of mine that gap and in doing so we begin to kind of smile recognizing the power of our thoughts and appreciating that we've become what we've given attention to and that we can actually relax that and welcome in a different understanding of ourselves. But I'm imagining, and I see this a lot in change, change is, change is hard mm -hmm. because I have to give up something. In this case, you're talking about I'm giving up the definition, even if it's been negative, mm -hmm. even if it's been something you know destructive mm -hmm. to me. It's the devil that I know. It's, mm. it's, it's something familiar to me. And what I'm doing in that gap is saying, wait a minute, this has never been true. Mm. I just thought that it was, and I didn't know any different. But now that I'm in this gap and I see something opening up and something being shed, that's actually not really who I am. Uh oh, and there's a place right there. There's got to be a place right there where people might get right. a little concerned about, well, what, who, who am I then? And there's got to be a right. kind of yeah. a place where, um, although we can get to a place where we recognize that we are already complete, it's just not known yet. There's got to be a place or a little crossroads moment that becomes a little unsettling for folks. Is that, do you experience that? Well, that, that's a brilliant point. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, well, of course, of course, I encounter this kind of, this phenomena uh, over and over again, actually. Uh, what what uh, compensates for this fear of, of being nothing? Because it, it, this is the fear, the fear of being nothing without all the familiar uh, uh, elements that uh, that have uh, enabled you to identify yourself. So, yeah. and it, it, it is true that sometimes even my greatest traumas, I can at least walk in the world presenting myself. I have a certain story to tell. Suddenly, I, I'm I'm robbed of my uh, my cherished narrative you see yes. so who would i be uh, and, and 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 this this is really <laughs> scary so so there is a certain i would say like it's like a dark tunnel that you need to to pass through and then i need to to promise people that 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 it's only their thinking their conditioned thinking that well whispers to them you are going to lose everything you are going to die I am yeah. telling them that that beyond this uh, this tunnel, they are only going to experience bliss. So there is there is this moment of of inner shivering, but then uh, there is uh, there is indeed if they feel that you are confident, if they know they look into your eyes and they know that you have gone through this, you have passed through this tunnel, and you speak from this bliss, then they trust you. And they follow you, and well, they do experience this <laughs> this bliss uh, always as they so, come out of that tunnel. Yeah. Yes, 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 and and this happens especially especially with uh, traumatized uh, people, yeah. because uh, of course uh, they they begin to experience this kind of uh, the the effect of the expanded states fields of consciousness. Uh, including freedom from problem consciousness, freedom from memory, uh, freedom from from being uh, affected or shaped by time, and then they begin to to experience this fear, yeah. and and you need to really walk with them hand in hand, 
until they reach a state in which they finally experience that they are bigger than their memory. Yes. You see? When you feel that way, because as long as you feel that you, you, you don't have self-existence, you, you are not big enough to contain the memory, taking the memory away, there's nothing left. Yes. I, I really appreciate this part of our discussion right now. You're talking about some of our existential fears and this fear that we have, if we really stop, that this fear of being nothing. And I, I love this. It's kind of paradoxical in a way. I've got this cherished narrative, even if it's a negative thing or even if it's not right. even accurate, but it's what I know. And that defines me. That identity gives me some security and certainty. But in order to shed that and to see that that's not real, I I'm going to go back over that piece right there. Um, there's this cherished narrative that we hold on to, even if it holds us down or is destructive or not even accurate, but it's what I know. And that, for some reason, provides something for me. And you're talking about in order to shed that, I get to go through this dark tunnel. And the, what we're saying here is, I don't know my true self yet. And I'm trusting that on the other end of that tunnel, there's going to be something that I'm going to organically evolve a deeper understanding of. I'm curious in those times of going through that tunnel, what is your role? And how do you, how do you stay with somebody? Let them look at you into your eyes and be able to kind of hold that position of stay with it. Trust this process. What are you doing in those times? Well, I would say that the role is, is, uh, is uh, to be uh, as compassionate as possible uh, on the one hand, and completely unwavering, completely uh, uh, unmovable on the other hand, you see, because you, you, you need to be compassionate. You, if, you, if you begin to, to resist yeah. uh, their resistance, this is what I always tell uh, uh, practitioners, people, people uh, uh, I train, don't resist people's resistance because, first of all, uh, resistance, uh, what we call resistance, I don't like this term uh, because, because it sounds as if, uh, as if people must go through something and then they resist it. But, but if, when they feel this kind of, of contraction in the, in the midst of the process, this is a, a part of their process. It's not something, it's not that they're, they are now, they, they now, they've now come out or, or left the process behind. This is a part of the process. Yes. So if you, if you don't create a division, you don't create a split and the conflict in the process, you don't tell them now you should expand. Come on, stop, <laughs> stop resisting. You, you say, yes, I understand it. This is, we all have it, this kind of fear. This is completely natural. And on the other hand, you, are, you must be completely confident. You, you must know, and you only know if you have mastered the law of attention. You see? Yes. If, yes. You can, if you can see through any kind of thought in the world, any kind of fear, any kind of emotion, any kind of memory, nothing frightens you as a therapist. Because if, we, if I have this kind of fear of my own feelings, my own emotions, of course, I would, I would waver, mm -hmm. you see? I would hesitate, hesitate to, to lead someone through a certain process, especially a process that, it, that is that ra as radical. I think that reminds us of the importance that as a therapist, making sure, or as a leader, or as a, a teacher, making sure that we do our own work first so that we are able to hold folks in a compassionate but also assertive place that says hey let's let's stay with this i know that it's hard you normalize it you universalize it you're saying this is normal everyone that goes through it right about this point and yes. you're saying stay with it i'm right here with you and let's go through it you know you as i mentioned earlier you you described the path that you help create that includes both the psychological and the spiritual principles moving you know folks through or helping them move through places of ambiguity and complex experiences and yep. into into that more integrated holistic and kind of clarified self transformation what is happening as those come together that psychological that spiritual as they get more and more through that tunnel and they're coming out that other side and they get to be on the other side of it in an ongoing way in their life what's going on mm. for those folks 
Yes, uh, I would say that that if we let, let's let's take for example uh, uh, trauma healing because uh, because what what happens in trauma healing is that uh, is that people are first of all uh, I would uh, what happens uh, in the broader state of consciousness is that they are released from victim consciousness. I think this is one of the most important uh, uh, components of uh, of uh, psychological maturity, not only spiritual evolution. Uh, this means that they are that they, they develop a, a certain form of self responsibility. Now they understand that that it's not uh, it's not necessarily that circumstances shape them, but the reaction to to circumstances uh, that that uh, shapes them, and and therefore they they. If they once, if they could at least once uh, uh, liberate themselves or release their victim, victim identity, they could do it uh, again and again, you see, yeah. in, in many other uh, aspects of their life. So what they experience usually is that the psychological content of their memor the memory has been wiped away. Yeah. And now they are able to, I would say, to to finally create their present and future. The the thing is that is that as long as we are uh, we are the products of our own thoughts, the products of our own emotions, we are shaped by them uh, uncontrollably, and as a result, our present and future are already predetermined. Yes. It's not that we can actually uh, shape them because we are unconsciously governed by certain what I call irrational memory connections. We have a, a certain certain uh, thought patterns uh, uh, that 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 are the thoughts behind our thoughts, <laughs> and they yes. rule our life. So so I think that the people feel that that they are able to uh, to uh, imbue their life with uh, with with meaning, uh, create. Uh, their present and future, and and take uh, full responsibility for their own suffering. This is this is the the first step. That's a really beautiful picture that you're helping us envision here. You're saying that as we come out of that tunnel, we're free of our past, whether it's victimization or anything that we are kind of enslaved by with these thoughts and feelings and emotions, etc. That we don't really recognize are so much governing in a destructive way, our lives, we, 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 we make the unconscious conscious. And then from there, I love what you're saying. We get to have personal responsibility. Now we have agency now and a responsibility mm -hmm. now that we're now mm -hmm. given to create the future that's possible for us. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the hope, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Otherwise we are, we, we are powerless. You see, I think I think that that if if there is one one thing that we are realizing that we have this ability in that is inherent in our mind to liberate ourselves to become our own source of 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 uh, uh, our own self liberating power. Mm -hmm. This is something that 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 if we if we are able to to even uh, slightly tap into this kind of power, this this is this must be life changing. I love that. You know, Shia, I, I, I know we're kind of coming to a close in our in our show today, but maybe kind of just dovetailing off of what you're just saying right there. We've got this liberating power. As, mm -hmm. as we wind down, would you leave our listeners with kind of a welcoming word, an inviting word about them considering weaving meditation more into their life to experience the things that you're talking about today? Yes, of course. I, I would simply uh, quote Einstein uh, who said we that we can't solve problems using the same level of thinking with which we created them. So, so yeah. what I, I would invite uh, uh, our listeners, our dear listeners, to is, is is to 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 understand that we somehow need to learn how to, we we can uh, transcend or move to to a higher or more refined plane in which our problems don't exist. And from there, uh, to, uh, resolve our problems and face our life. So one, one good uh, uh, ad advice, one practical advice would be that whenever you, you are facing a certain challenge, 
or a certain problem in your life, don't don't try to resolve it using uh, the ordinary level of thinking, but rather enter into meditation, settle in this in this uh, expanded state of being, and then from there look at your problem. Yes. So because a problem cannot resolve a problem. <laughs> only peace, only silence, only freedom can face problems. Really good. And what you're saying is that, and this is this is the hope here too, we can create that state from which to work through, go through and understand things and actually actually grow in a transformative way. Sha, I would love our listeners to be able to learn more about you after our show today, your work, uh, your book, The Complete Book of Meditation. Tell us how our listeners can follow up with you after today's show. I would invite uh, 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 people to uh, to take a look at uh, my website, my official website, which is shai to Bali, S H A I T U B A L I dot com. Uh, this website contains uh, all my upcoming events, including seminars and uh, and uh, uh, lectures, uh, professional training, and retreats, silent re silent retreats. Uh, and also a blog containing all kinds of articles about uh, everything that we've discussed today. Very good. And I would I would invite people to uh, to take a look at uh, my YouTube channel, where there are hundreds of lectures and guided meditations. Uh, th this I think would be the the, the best the, the most accessible way to uh, tap into this work. Very good. Well, Shai, I thank you so much for being back with us today. It's so great to have you on this clinician series, and uh, I certainly enjoy our times together. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a, it's a great joy being together. Thank you. Thank you. Also want to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining Shai and me today. It's always great to have you with us as well. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT, and explore our archive of podcasts and other resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today.